Welcome, listeners, to SMQB's episode 127. It's August 14th, and we are down two quarterbacks, Bison and Milk. But we have Pope from Dallas, uh, House from Philly, and I'm Rooster from Richmond, Virginia, and we're ready to go. You can uh, hear us on Spotify, Apple Pod, or wherever you get your podcasts, and see us on YouTube. Um Guys, let's start out with a, a number. Pope, what's your number this week? Less than 14. What is that? <laughs> <laughs> what is that? <laughs> it's presumably the age of Wander Franco's latest squeeze. <laughs> yeah, apparently now we know how he got the name Wander. <laughs> oh, my God. House, give us a number. My number is 10. 10 is reserved for the greatest player on the soccer team. 10 is the number worn by the greatest to ever wear it, Lionel Messi. 10 is the number my kids better give me for taking them to the game tomorrow night in Philadelphia. <laughs> and 10 is the number of part-time jobs I'm going to have to take to afford those tickets. All right. Have fun. Have fun, Milrods. Excited. My number is 34. Fernando 34. Valenzuela. Finally, they – the LA Dodgers retired his number. This is a guy who played in, in the major league baseball for 17 years. And in, in 1981 during Fernando mania was named rookie of the year, won the Cy Young and the Dodgers won the world series in his first eight games as a, as a rookie, he pitched eight complete games had eight wins, and five of them were shutouts. So congratulations, Fernando, and it's about time, Dodgers. Good stuff. Good good for the Dodgers. Yeah. All right. So, House, you're going to be in the running for uh, Father of the Year. I take it after tomorrow night. I better be. <laughs> Damn it. <laughs> Although Messi might be, too, with what he's bringing home now. D- does uh, – who is your team, the Union? Philadelphia Union. So what's interesting about this game is that I had mentioned a few weeks back that there is now like a world champions league, not just a European champions league from all the leagues around the world. And the top three from this league's cup that's going on right now make this champions league. So whoever wins this game between Miami and Philly is automatically in the world champions league next year being played in the U S and the loser can still make it playing for the third place game. So there's actually a, a lot at stake in this game. So there's going to be three teams from each of the major European and South American leagues who are all coming here worldwide. Yeah. The best, the best of the best worldwide. It's going to be pretty cool. Wow. That's going to be awesome. A little uh, yeah. world cup preview. Yeah, for sure. So guys, let's move on to, uh, we talked to, we talked a little while ago about how, crazy we thought it was that espn fired stan van gundy who i think we all agree or jeff van gundy who i think we all agree is probably the was probably the best analyst in uh nba on and nba commentator um we thought that it was because he was too critical of the refs the, the league didn't like that, and ESPN capitulated to the league. Now we see the Orioles suspending Kevin Brown. They're, they're um, one of their announcers for what? What, what, what was his sin? He, the Orioles were playing in Tampa, and he was simply – you know how these announcers do this – like pregame, like what's on tap at, in, in the series? What's at stake? Yep. You know, and he was basically saying, well, the Rays got, I mean, the Orioles got to turn it around from their history. They have a very poor history playing here at Tropicana Field. They haven't won here in a long time and they've played very poorly there. And that was it. It was, there were graphics. And he just said, hopefully with this improved team this year, they're going to turn it around. I mean, it was, a little bit condescending, maybe a little sarcastic, you know, but not over the top. No so, way. So the team the suspended him because he he wasn't rah rah Orioles. Instead, he was giving some uncomfortable facts. Right? Isn't isn't that what it really boils down to? That's certainly an interpretation for sure. Um. So I don't know. 
if you guys remember, I think you guys probably remember back in the bad old days of sports broadcasting, the, you know, it was the color person was always some dumb jock who had really little of interest to say, just trying to, you know, t tell war stories and, you know, dandy Don Meredith singing, turn out the lights, the party's over at the end of Monday night football. I, for one, am glad that we're finished with that kind of nonsense. And we have guys like Jeff Van Gundy who, you know, turns a critical eye to the referees, et cetera. I mean, what do you guys think? Does anyone think that the, the teams should or the leagues should, you know, sort of bully the the networks into putting patsies in there? I, I'm going to try to play the other side of this argument, which is – uh, it's our league. It's our team. Uh, we make money based on viewers, based on advertisers and viewers and cable subscriptions and all these things. And if someone is criticizing our product, why would we keep them if it, if it runs the risk at lowering the value of our product? So we have every right to say, hey, listen. We like intelligence. We like honesty. But it, if what you're going to do is potentially turn viewers or advertisers away from our game, we'd rather have somebody different or we'd rather suspend you. Is there a reason that when you're when you're the boss and you own the place, why you can't call the shots? You can call the shots. The question is, is it a good idea? I think you run the risk of insulting your fans insulting the intelligence of your fans by trying to micromanage the message. Um, you know, fans are grownups. They can handle that. They don't want, they don't want some Homer who has nothing of interest to say. They want, they want somebody who's interesting in my opinion. Yeah. I, I mean, listen, I presented the other side. I think this is awful. I think I, I'm going to miss Jeff Van Gundy. I thought he had some really clever ideas about, he had this, he had this interesting idea about eliminating free throws until like the last four minutes of the game. If you get fouled and you add two points. Uh, and if it's, you know, if you get fouled beyond the three point, you add three points. So maybe a team has to strategize and think about how aggressively they want to defend. The point is he was being analytical and critical. He, he wasn't afraid to say that was a bad call by the ref. It affected the game. And I think exactly to your point, the fans loved that honesty. It felt like you were listening to someone who was really willing to be critical and tell the truth about the game. And if you know that all you're going to watch now is a bunch of lap dogs, no thanks. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Do, do you assume Doc Rivers and Doris Burke are just going to be lap dogs? I mean, they must have gotten the memo from this, right? I mean, I, Doris I, Burke's good. I like her. I mean, it'll be interesting to see how she does. Yeah. I, I like her, but I uh, I want to I want to hear I want to hear if if there's no criticisms of the refs, if there's if there's obvious things and they just sugarcoat it, you're you're gonna know right away what what the memo was to Doris and Doc. Yeah, yep. you know, used to some of these announcers and color guys were larger than life. I mean, think back to to uh, Harry Carey and Steve Stone with the uh, with the Cubs. Um, w, uh, NT or whatever the hell it was. Um, and, uh, the, the notion of like, you know, Harry Carey, he was, he's always critical of the Cubs. I mean, they were the laughable, lovable Cubs, but the notion that they would suspend him for two weeks because he was critical of the Cubs is a joke. So, I mean, it's just a different time. And, uh, you know, I don't know if the Orioles are leading the charge in, uh, going after their own, uh, announcers for being critical of the team, but, I don't like the direction if that's where they're headed. Timing couldn't be worse either. The Orioles are having their best year in, in decades, and they just stepped on it with this one. Um, let's, let's hope this isn't a trend. Let, let, let's hope that the, the blowback that came against the Orioles, by the way, from many, many announcers that came to the aid of Kevin Brown's cause here, let, let's hope that other teams learn the lesson. Like It, it doesn't help to go this way. Speaking of trends, you know, you can't listen to 
other pod sports podcasts anymore or even turn on the television without seeing ads for sports betting sports gambling um pope has 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 gambling um penetrated sports too too is it beyond reproach has it gone too far and is there anything we can do about it i mean i i don't know you know one thing uh i don't know if you guys saw this but uh ESPN is now going to launch their own, you know, competition to DraftKings and FanDuel, uh, which is going to be really interesting. And uh, Dave Portnay from Barstool, what he just got five hundred. He he sold his company for five hundred million, and he just they sold it back to him for zero dollars, one dollar uh, or one dollar. Yeah, and um, you know that's obviously um, the direction more more sports betting ahead. Uh, for um for the big uh for, for the big groups so uh does that make it then acceptable for the athletes uh, to to bet i mean ask pete rose i mean he's still you know um a pariah and not allowed in the hall of fame because he he bet on baseball arguably bet either with or against his team um phil mickelson on the other hand his notorious big big gambler um he uh, uh, if you think back to like the mid 2000s, I believe um, he he changed his clubs like in the middle of the season and went to Callaway because Callaway, Eli Callaway evidently uh, bailed him out of significant gambling debt. And so Phil, you know, was uh, beholden to, to uh, Callaway for that. Uh, but um, his buddy uh, uh, help me out with the name Walters. Right. Yeah. Um has come out with a book where he alleges some just explosive. I mean, with Phil, I mean, what, what else could be more explosive now, but uh, explosive allegations that, that Mickelson bet over 1 billion, that's a B billion with a B dollars on sports over the period of time that, that they were um, collaborating. Why does everyone always say that's a billion with a B? Is there another way to spell billion? (laughs) <laughs> just good for emphasis okay i mean we could do That's trillion funny. with a t but now billion with a b That's funny. <laughs> it's just for it's just like it's like you know the uh the uh, emphasis that you put on on something on the text uh and so uh part of this and this is my the funniest story i've got uh, from this whole thing if if true is you know he's obviously a, a big time better in nfl football and so he took his guys out on uh, years ago, uh, the flu is playing to Vegas. Uh, you know, they got put up. I don't know where it was. Uh, they give him the, you know, red carpet treatment. Uh, they all go down uh, to bet. And, uh, you know, they're like, hey, Phil, why don't you go ahead, you know, trying to be deferential to him. And Phil's like, no, 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 you guys, you guys go ahead and make your bets. He goes, because when I make my bet, the line might move. There you go. Pope, does the PGA have rules against betting on matches for players participating in the matches? Well, I, I, I haven't studied that rooster, but I would be shocked if they didn't. Uh, but, um, you know, obviously there's big money that's exchanged during these pro-ams and, you know, they always have these money games that you always hear about big, big money. But the, the one that, that probably is the most con, uh, you know, uh, the one that everybody's talking about is, did Phil actually try to put a four hundred thousand dollar bet on the two thousand twelve Ryder Cup? Now, he granted he was going to put the money on the American side, and they were heavily favored. Um, did did he actually try to put a bet uh, on the match? Um, just think of the you know implications that potentially could have. And you know Americans actually lost. That was a, a horrific uh, Ryder Cup meltdown comeback. meltdown on Sunday, um, and you know. Phil didn't even win his match. Not that that mattered, assuming he had a bet. But that's a that's a good question, Rooster. I mean, is there any kind of uh, ramification for Phil? Now, of course, he's not a member of the PGA Tour anymore. So, you know, I think the Saudis are going to slap him for gambling. Well, we certainly so. know why he sold his soul to the Saudis. Now, he's a, if he lost a billion dollars in, in gambling. I mean, is that, is that a reason? I think there's a legitimate question yeah. now. Oh, yeah. so, no question that that part of the reason that he took the Saudi money was that, you know, he, he needed it. He needed it for that purpose. 
So uh, another 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 issue is, you know, the NFL certainly has strict yeah. rules against players betting. I mean, you can't even bet on any sport when you're in a club facility. Mm-hmm. Yep. And that's so, been a problem. You know, it's been a problem. Calvin Rid- Ridley paid the price for a fifteen hundred dollar bet and was out for a year. And these guys, these young guys can't seem to figure this out. I mean, what does it take for them to get it? Um, we've had uh, two guys on the Colts. We've had a guy on the Titans. We've had a bunch of guys on the Lions, the Commanders, all all fine for either betting on football or betting on other sports while they're in the facility. Do you feel sorry for these guys or are they just stupid? Yes. I think, <laughs> yes, they're stupid. Yeah. No, both, you know, oh, yes, yeah. I feel, they're stupid and I feel sorry for them. I think that I think that penalty for Calvin Ridley was ridiculous. It's not like he's doing drugs or right or a criminal. I mean, come on, guys. Right. And he was first one. But once that happened, you're on notice. I mean, they're going to suspend a star like Calvin Ridley for a fifteen hundred dollar bet. You, I mean, uh, you can't say you don't know at that point, man. I, I, I you're right. They they are stupid for not heeding the penalty but your lead to this whole topic i think summarized it all which is you can't go anywhere if you you can't go to any app like uh score mobile cbs sports you name it every single time you look up anything sports related there's an invitation to place a bet Mm -hmm. and i think these players have been socialized in an era where people make little bets. It's just part of the culture is making the bets. And uh, I think they think it's it's no big deal. Now you're right. You know, if you've been told and if you've been given the handbook and the team says, hey, listen, guys, we need you on the field. Don't make any bets and certainly never make them inside the, you know, the property of the clubhouse or the property of the facility. But I I think it's been I think the whole issue of gambling and sports not only has been normalized for the players, but I think it's normalized for the fans. I mean, our reaction to all this is, oh, big deal for Calvin Ridley. Or I really don't sense there's been that big of a reaction even to the Phil stuff. I mean, it's an eye popping number, but it's not like people are like, let's let's throw the book at him. Now, yes, Pete Rose's situation was different. He was betting on his own team. But I think the reaction to Pete Rose betting on baseball in the past is so much different than where this falls in the headlines today. It's been normalized. We just don't really care that much. I don't know if that's a good or bad thing, but we don't. Well, it's 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 been normalized unless you're Isaiah Rogers and Rashad Berry, the Colts, who got waived after after being suspended. Um Quintez Cephas of the Lions was released, uh, and Stanley Berryhill um, of the Lions was released, or, or uh, maybe he was with the uh, Commanders. But it's still a big deal for these young guys who, if they haven't learned the lesson and they get caught, unless they're a star and the team's willing to ride out a six-game to to full season suspension, they're they're gone. So I mean, they need to smarten up, and their agents do too. Um, you guys think you want to move, hit the, hit the, uh, preseason thing or move on? I mean, I'll just say this about the preseason as Aaron Rodgers says, after the Packers start every year, oh, and two relax, <laughs> relax. I mean, I feel bad for some of these guys. Like even like, you know, they basically have Trey Lance out of football at this point, um, I mean, there's nothing that's not under the microscope of every play. I mean, the Giants drafted some cornerback. Uh, what's his name? Deontay Banks. Yeah, yeah. Th- th- they have this kid in the Hall of Fame after one preseason game. It- relax, relax. Right, right. But I'll tell you what. If I was the, uh, if I if I traded away three first round picks for Trey Lance. I would not be relaxing right now because he looks lost out there. He just does. He looks just like Richardson and Stroud and young in a way where, you know, the, the game hasn't slowed down for them yet, but they're rookies. Trey Lance is what second or third year. He's essentially a rookie with his injuries. I mean, he's almost like a rookie. 
I don't know, man. I, I'll I'll compare him to the way Jordan Love looked. Um, if I if I were a manager, if I were a coach of an NFL football team. I would just be playing my second and third strings to find out if any of these guys can really play at an NFL level and the difference between that close call about whether I should take a whether I should keep a fifth or a sixth running back, a fourth or a fifth, and who's it going to be. Other than that, I'm not getting my starters injured and I'm just not overestimating anything that I see on the field. Do you disagree, Pope? No, preseason is a joke. I mean, yeah, the headline in Dallas was that the the game was more uh, important for uh, Mike McCarthy calling the plays again for the first time in what five five or six years than it was for the players who a lot of them won't ever even see the field during the regular season because they'll be cut uh yeah it's just i mean i'll give you an overreaction everybody loves deuce vaughn they they are you know fawning over him he's the next coming of the scat back and uh, uh we love him we'll see but he he was the to me he was the breakout star for our preseason game. Well, speaking of evaluating the second team, if I were the 49ers in addition to being scared to death about Trey Lance ever becoming more than a third string quarterback, I'd be really worried about my second team offensive line. I mean, the first the first few uh series, it was like a it was like a bank robbery. Yeah, You know, it's like a bull rush on Trey Lance. Um, you know, once they get past that first first team offensive line, which is pretty good, uh, they they look like it, Swiss cheese. So they're not they've got some depth problems. It looks like house. What in the hell is going on with James Harden again? Oh, my God. I mean, you have you them. learned your lesson? I remember you were all excited about James Harden and we were like, James Harden is James Harden. He's going to screw you in the end. Well, you know, I want to root for the guy. He has some staggering statistics. He still has a lot of game. He was the NBA assist leader last year. And so this morning, um, you know, just as I'm turning on Harden, there's this video that everybody's seen now where he says, I'll never play for an organization run by Daryl Morey. He's a liar. He said this to like a crowd of kids that he was like going to some fourth grade class or something like this. He said, let me repeat that. He decided to repeat it. I'll never play for Daryl Morey. He's a liar. So now I'm thinking, you know, Morey really hasn't been that great. He's definitely had some missteps. Should I start defending Harden about this? And then there's an article that comes out later this afternoon. One of the things that Harden's upset about is that, Friday, Maury promised Fridays was going to be Pizza Friday. And <laughs> this is a true story. This is Harden. Harden acknowledges this and that Maury said he would have pizza every single Friday. And the first Friday, they had pizza. But the Friday after that, they didn't have pizza. And no Fridays after that did you have pizza. And so, does that, what does that tell you about a guy's? were way, way to keep his word but the point of all this is rooster that it's not that let's keep your word to keep to give out pizza you have said i don't know at least 10 times on this pod if you signed a contract keep your word and stay to your contract so after missing out on pizza friday on multiple weeks James Harden opted in to a $35.6 million contract that he signed with the Sixers. That wasn't under duress. And, it, um, he, and waved he knew he wasn't pizza. getting his pizza at that point. He waived well, the pizza argument at that point. <laughs> well, he, that's a good question, though, about maybe not duress, but maybe under, if we're going to stay in the legal world, on reliance, that he relied – that Maury, this is what I think it's all going to come down to. You, you said you needed a little bit more time to get done. Just sign the contract, no matter what, you have a contract, but you will get me traded to the Clippers. You promised you would get me traded to the Clippers, and you didn't do that. Now, I don't know. I mean, is that duress? No. Are you pissed off at a player if you were under false pre- pretenses led to sign a contract knowing that you'd be traded and then someone didn't keep their word? I mean, that's his side of the story. But a trade is a two-team two, two team deal. Yeah. 
I mean, Maury can't force the Clippers to take Harden for for a fair price, right? And Harden has to understand something. He he averaged 21 points a game last year. That's kind of a dime a dozen these days. Lots of young players can average 20 points a game for a whole lot less money than he's making without all the headaches. And maybe even play a little defense while they're at it. Yeah. But listen, I hear you, and I and I and I'm I'm increasingly with you on hard. And some people say like, just trade them for a bag of chips if all if that's all they're going to give. Uh, that seems like I don't know. That seems more like of an a asset big, than that. Yeah, big, yeah, it's more of an asset than that. But listen, you guys have all had players on your own teams that are in a contract year or might even be two years from doing it. And they sit out and they say, Hey, I'm not one of the top 10 paid running backs and I'm in the top five in stats or whatever is the position on the field and whatever is the sport. Is it the same across the board? Is it the same argument across the board? If you're under contract, show up and play, don't hold out. Don't ask for a new contract. Are there any situations where there's an exception to the rule? Well, it might be a, smart business move to take a guy like Aaron judge or Embiid or, you know, your true superstar and say, Hey, I know you've got a year left, but we'd like to renegotiate your deal now, you know, Otani maybe, you know, but Jonathan Taylor for the Colts had one good year and one mediocre year. And so, and his contract is not up this year. It's up a year from now. And the Colts, said don't you know don't worry we're going to take care of you and then he gets a new agent and starts running his mouth about how he's going to hold out and all this stuff he just shot himself in the foot he's not going to get the deal that he could have had before but you know holdouts do work though because in dallas today we signed zach martin to a two-year 36 million dollar contract but that's jerry contract year it wasn't his contract year he was upset because he was the seventh highest paid player in his position. And he's an all pro perennial and wasn't happy. So he sat out, you know, all the activities preseason and up until now. And, and he got rewarded. When Uh, hasn't that worked with Jerry Jones though? But I think, I mean, you could argue with Zeke, it took him too long to do it, but uh, Jerry's Jerry's not unique. There, there are other owners that will succumb to a star holding out. So, I mean, there's a difference between Harden's antics and I think, you know, just for leverage, people saying that they want more money because they're underpaid for their position. The problem with Harden is if he doesn't get his way, he's going to hold his breath until his face turns blue, and then he's going to show up fat and out of shape and not play very well for you next year and take your $35.6 million and sit there and pout. Here's why I think it's a Look out strip clubs. Here's why I think it's a real legitimate gripe on on Harden and the difference between Harden. He has a legitimate gripe. No, no. Why we we have a legitimate gripe against Harden and maybe not so much against Jonathan Taylor and against Zach Martin. You know, the big thing about the NFL is there with rare exception, there is no guaranteed contract and it's a violent sport filled with concussions and career ending injuries that are early on. I don't begrudge those guys that much if they're at the top of their game and they say, I know that I'm not yet at the end of my contract, but I'm performing at the top of my position and I'm not being paid right. And at a bare minimum, I want a guarantee. Sorry, go ahead. I was just going to say with the NBA and almost all other sports, it's a different story. I think your argument makes great sense for Josh Jacobs and Saquon Barkley, but, uh, Jonathan Taylor had two years under his belt, and one of which was mediocre. Yeah, maybe he is. Maybe he has the least leverage of all those guys. But but Harden's contract and the NBA contracts are guaranteed contracts. Um, and I I just I don't get it. I don't think. You, look, uh, yes, it's true. These player these players are not property. They're not just chattel. And they shouldn't be owned in that way. But when you, like you said, you opted in, you said, I'm going to do this deal. You can't now hold an entire team hostage. And that's what he's doing. He did it in Brooklyn. I think he did it 
maybe in Houston. He definitely um, did it in Houston. He he loafed his way out of Houston. And so, you know, I, it, it surprises me that a team like the Clippers, even if they have trophies in their eyes, want that problem. You know, he's going to do it to them too. Who's what's Kyrie's deal right now? Is he still trying to? He's happy. Find a new team, or is he happy with the? Mavs? No, he signed. He signed Max deal with, with the Mavs. He seems happy. He hadn't said anything. Hadn't done anything. He's got some new line of shoe and all that kind of stuff. But you know, I'm sure. Mark my wait words. Till, wait till we get closer to yeah. the season. Mark my words. At the end of this season, you're going to be like that fucking Kyrie Irving. <laughs> Speaking of which, does anybody have you have a punchable face, Pope? Don't you? No, oh, I've got a, a, a whale of a punch. All right, let's uh, see it. Let's, let's it, hear it'll the be roundhouse. A, hopefully, it'll be a joint punch. Um, so you know, uh, back in two thousand, oh, I can't remember the year. Uh, the the movie that won uh, an Oscar for Sandra Bullock, The Blind Side based on the life of Michael Orr, who was, you know, the consummate left tackle who protected your quarterback's blind side. And he was, he was a rare uh, athlete and, you know, elite. Everybody wanted him. Um, he's one of 12 kids, grew up in poverty and in Memphis. And um, a, a family, uh, the Tuies, um, Sean and Leanne adopted him, or so he thought, Air quotes, uh, air quotes, in case you're not yes, watching people. Yes, air quotes, adopted him um, as adopted with a member a. of their family uh, when he went to their prep school. Uh, they took him in. Um, mysteriously, he turned down offers from Alabama, LSU, and other national powers to go to the Tui's uh, alma mater, Ole Miss, to play football for a couple of years before he eventually was drafted uh, by the Titans um, and uh, had a very successful, you know, eight year career, probably made about 34 million ish is what I've, what I've been able to find out. Uh, but the story was how the two took him under their wing, advised him, brought him up, you know, the old Hollywood story. Um, Hollywood loves the little bit of race story too. He's, african-american the twoies are you know a middle upper class white family that take him in it's just a love story and um sandra bullock won an oscar uh tim mcgraw played uh uh mr Tui and got a lot of uh you know acclaim for that um and the movie made like 300 million dollars uh but that's not the end of the story guys because uh in february and i guess michael orr had been suspicious for a while but in February, he found out that he was never legally adopted by the Tuies. In fact, what they had done is after he had turned 18, they came to him with some papers and said, hey, here, sign this. Because you're over 18, we can't adopt you. But what we're doing is creating a conservatorship with all intents and purposes is just like adoption. But we can't because you're over 18. So he signed away his rights to anything that potentially could uh, – he could profit from his they, own story. Convert, conservatorship means that they control his finances. They controlled his finances. Correct. They cut the deals. So they got paid a quarter million dollars or so. Um, Each of the four family members got over a quarter million dollars off the movie royalties. And they plus, wrote a book. And they got 2.5% of the royalties from the book. Michael Lewis wrote a book in 2006. Uh, they got royalties off of that. <laughs> uh Leanne Tui's gone across the country, a uh, motivational speaker, you know, the whole part of the story. So when Orr found out he wasn't legally adopted uh, and he did not get not one penny from his story. Now, understandably, he got a little miffed. So he went to uh, a firm in Nashville. Well, I'm going to have Toby talk about that in a second. And hired these guys and they filed a petition today. And so it hit, it hit big time media today uh, where he is seeking an end to the conservatorship and he's seeking uh, an accounting of all of the profits that the Tuies have made off of his story, his likeness is, you know, it's NIL, right? 
they're, they're seeking all of those profits and accounting of that uh, and and don't know where it's headed, but it's not a pretty story. And um, it's just, you know, it's just greed, Brewster, because all the two he's had to do was just give him a percentage of of their percentage or cut a better deal for him or give him any money. So, you know, that's that's just or not lie to them. him about or not lie to him about conservatorship being right. a alternative to adoption once you're 18. Right. Yeah. And I'm sure, you know, there's going to be another side to the story. They're like, oh, you know, full of transparent. He knew exactly what we were doing. He and but, you know, he thought it was in his best interest. You know, who knows? I doubt that they got him a lawyer independently to verify what was in his best interest. Because I'm pretty sure they would never agree to this. They also sat um, by as consultants to that movie and 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 did nothing when Hollywood tried to portray Michael Orr as some unintelligent, you know, dumbass. Which he's well, not. that was Brewster. That was the Hollywood story. Yeah, you know these these white nice white couple is taking this uneducated uh, poor black kid under their wing and raising him up. Uh, probably another pod we could discuss that differently but um that's really not for us to discuss but but what i want to know toby is who is who have they hired uh and and or who is michael Orr hired and what do you think yeah i mean gerard stranch is a top-notch lawyer he represented most of the counties in the state of tennessee in the recent large opioid national opioid litigation he's a top litigator I, when i saw he was attached to this i knew that it was not only a a serious uh and legit claim that's being made but that the tui family uh is is not is not going to be able to move through this thing with ease they're really going to have to give answers here and you know the thing the thing that i wonder when i heard this story today is is one of the reasons that they shorted this guy is because they thought, well, he's making his NFL money. So what does he need from the movie money? If that's the case, it's an even bigger punch. Yeah. I mean, the, 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 the it's kid, greed. Who, it's greed. It's greed. And I really hope that this didn't turn out in such a way that they deliberately – misrepresented things to this to this kid it was very upsetting reading the stuff about that i didn't really know before reading the story today that they that they sat idly by while he was displayed as a dumb kid because he said it really affected his career and his career earnings and the way people took him seriously because that that was after all how he was how he was portrayed i'm just going to say it they 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 are despicable people and they're getting a pope punch as you get a double to a punch. milk slap, <laughs> a double punch, and a roundhouse, and and a knee in the balls. <laughs> I mean, it's just oh. it's just so fucking offensive, guys. It really is when you think about it. Yeah, it is, and it, it's, it's not it's disgusting. It, it is not going to be the end of the story on this pod. We'll be following this and giving you guys regular updates. House, do you have a punchable face? I don't have a punch, but I do have a feel-good lasso unless you have a punch. No, no, I don't have a punch. Let's hear your lasso. So you guys, everybody, the whole world saw this past Wednesday when the Phillies' uh, Michael Lorenzen had his uh, no-hit 7 nothing win over the Washington Nationals. And it was not only his first start at home for the Phillies, uh, the guy had never even had a complete game before in his career. Um and Rob Thompson, the Phillies manager, had never managed or been part of a no-hitter. But that actually is not the lasso, amazingly, even in the face of a no-hitter. Because in that same game, uh, seven innings before that unfolded, in the second inning, Weston Wilson came to bat. Weston Wilson was called up from the AAA Farm Club for the Phillies because – Brandon Marsh, one of our outfielders, suffered an injury and they needed to fill in. Weston Wilson came to bat as a first timer in the MLB at 28 years old. Before that, he had had 2,836 minor league plate appearances. He was drafted in 2016 
uh, out of Clemson University by the Milwaukee Brewers and never reached the majors. Uh, at one point in time, he had to step away from minor league ball for a year. He was driving for a food service company. At one point, he thought his career was over because of a blood clot in his shoulder. Um, he was the typical career minor leaguer, but he got his call. And when he got his call, he brought his parents, his sister, uh, his brother, and his wife, and another 15 to 20 friends. And he comes up to the plate and his first ever at bat, and he mashes one about 430 feet to left center. And you just could see the story of this guy's career play out in his father's eyes. Oh. Like his father had gone to all these games and watched his kid try to make the dream come true. And I'm sure like a lot of these kids, you know, you're a very ballyhooed athlete when you're in high school and then you get a you get a you get a scholarship to Clemson, which is a great baseball team, and you just think it's gonna play out. And then it never does. And you think the dream is over. And then you you got the call. And as as Wilson put it, he when he hit that home run he couldn't even feel his feet when he was rounding the bases. And it was just one of those great first time in the MLB stories. It is why baseball is such a romantic game. It was awesome. If you, if you watch a replay of that and you, you see the part where the cameras zoom in on his dad in the bleachers fighting back tears. And if you watch that and you're not about to start crying, there's something wrong with you. It's awesome. Which is great. Which brings me to my lasso. I've I, I've enjoy watching Hall of Fame speeches. I don't know why. Probably because I'm also uh, into the history of the sports. And you know, I've seen some really bad ones. Michael Jordan's <laughs> comes to mind. Maybe oh. the worst Hall of Fame speech I've ever ever offensive heard. It was all narcissistic, chest pounding, so score settling. I wanted to vomit after I listened to that speech. I contrast that with the one this weekend by D Wade, Dwayne Wade gave his hall of fame speech and hardly spoke about himself at all. Instead, he kept saying, we, we made it, we made it. And he was referring to his dad who supported him the whole way. And, you know, D Wade is like some celebrity fashion guy now and is very comfortable in front of the cameras and very sophisticated you could tell his dad was somewhat terrified to be standing there and haven't been asked to stand up and then d wade calls his dad up to the podium with him and he says dog we're in the hall of fame that's so good and, and I'll, I'll tell you what i just recommend to our listeners pull that up and watch that It'll bring a tear to your eye. It's a really joyous moment, and it's the right way to give a Hall of Fame speech. Way to go, Dwayne Wade. And and I know Bison loved that. He he wrote me to make sure I, I saw the part about the Iverson part. You you also you got to watch the whole Wade speech and what he does and the tribute he gives to Iverson and how emotional that is, and how much it affected Dwayne Wade's game and being an individual on the court. Uh, just everything about it. That was that was one of the classiest speeches I've ever seen. Uh, athlete given one of these Hall of Fame things. I, great lasso. That was awesome. And a shout out to my boy Dirk for getting into the Hall of Fame at the same time. Another great speech. Oh, really? It's, I thought he was already in. No, nope, sh- this was it. He should have been. Huh? Yeah, no. Interesting. I've, he's he's now five years from re- uh, retirement. Huh. So might as well do a trifecta because I've got. I was going to do a buzzer beater with this, but I think it's more of a lasso. See if you guys agree. Um, I don't know if y'all been following the travails of Lucas Glover the last couple of weeks, but yeah, you talk about the ultimate journeyman grinder on the PGA tour. Now he did win us open back in 2009 at Beth page black denying Phil, uh, his career grand slam. But, uh, since then, you know, it's been up and down with more downs than ups. He, uh, his totally lost his putting stroke. Uh, with a with a regular putter and uh, finally got to the point where um, he said he was either going to uh, putt left-handed or putt like a pool cue like uh, on Caddyshack but um, he adopted the uh, long-handed long handle putter like Adam Scott has and and has you know used to great effect and 
Guys, going into the final PGA tournament of the year in Greensboro, the Wyndham, he was ranked 112, wow. which, which put him uh, 50 slots or so outside of the top 70, uh, which would have guaranteed him uh, an opportunity to go play uh, this week in the FedEx, uh, which is the first uh, FedEx Cup playoff uh, uh, tournament. Um, and then he won in Greensboro, which raised him to 49th. And by doing that, I don't know if y'all saw this, but he eliminated Jason, Justin Thomas because JT missed the FedEx playoff by one. He was 71. And if Lucas Glover hadn't won that tournament, JT would have been 70. But Lucas, not only did he win that, he won this week again, and now he is number four on the FedEx Cup list, and he is a hot, uh, as hot a golfer. He's got like 22 rounds in the 60s uh, out of the last 23 rounds. Um, he's definitely being considered by Zach Johnson for the Ryder Cup now, uh, and this guy was struggling so much that he was thinking about putting left hand earlier this year. So, Crazy. I mean, it is crazy, and you know it's just a great story. Luke, Lucas Glover, um, good family man, got you know uh, finally put it all together, and that's what Alaska is all about. It's a feel good story for Lucas. Anybody have a buzzer beater? I have a buzzer beater. Um, as Messi comes to Philadelphia tomorrow, we've talked before about what he's doing for the MLS game. You know, today. We found out that Neymar is over to one of the other Saudi Arabian clubs, mm. Al Halal. That's a punch. I just, I don't get it. The legend grows larger about Messi um, as these other guys cash in over in Saudi Arabia. Messi's going to cash in too, but he's 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 changing a game. He's changing a team. W you know, I was thinking as we talk, sometimes we joke about like who's the greatest of all time and who left the other person in the rearview mirror because he got the latest championship. Is it Brady? Is it this person? I don't know. At age 36, winning the World Cup, coming to an MLS team, not losing a game yet, making free kicks. What this guy is doing is is storybook. It's Hollywood and it's awesome. Pope, you got a buzzer beater? Messy mania coming to Philly. Yeah, so a little update here on conference uh, realignment because uh, now that we have the Pac-4 left, um, there is a lot of uh, consternation about what's going to happen with those teams, Cal, Stanford, Oregon State, Washington State, and how does that impact uh, college football in general and all these conference realignments. Big day tomorrow. Uh, it is the last day that an ACC team can give word that they are trying to leave the ACC. All eyes are on Florida State. Uh, will they try to exercise uh, their option and leave and pay a hundred million dollar uh, grant of uh, whatever release? Um, if they do, then who knows where everything's going to topple. Uh, the biggest shock to me this week, guys, and you guys saw that in my response on, on the thread was when there was a rumor that SMU, my Mustangs, were actually being considered to go to the ACC along with Cal and Stanford. Uh, Crazy. That, that was crazy. Crazy town. No clearly, way. Clearly, that was never really in the cards. Uh, but uh, I don't know what's going to happen with Cal and Stanford. They are two very attractive schools. And, you know, whether they end up going to the Mountain West or the AAC, where I think Toby and I would probably like to see them go, uh, that's going to tell us a lot about what happens to college football uh, this fall. And then finally, um, my weekly update on Jordan Addison and this uh, sad bullshit story about his yeah, dog. What happened with the, yeah, what happened with the dog? Right? So, you know, I'm, I'm out of options from down here in Dallas. So I, uh, I did a lifeline to our good buddy, Mike Bryant, and, you know, one of our strongest pod listeners, the mayor up in, up in Minneapolis. And I reached out to him today to find out if he knew anything. He's got his feelers out. He's got a buddy who, you know, can finally hopefully get some inside scoop. But, but you know, this guy is using this dog story to cover up uh, his antics. And, and we the, this pod – probably of any other in the country is going to ferret that shit out. Keeping you accountable. Uh, you, are on, you are on I'm, notice, I'm George. Starting We're coming to, after your I'm ass. I'm starting to wonder if we will, Pope. Three weeks. Come on, man. Get get your researchers. If, on if I have to go to Minneapolis and get to the bottom of this, by God, I will for our listeners. <laughs> All right. Not quite in the All budget, right. but we'll think yeah. about it. <laughs>
uh, I have a quick pour out for uh, Rajan Amaroff. He was the 2020 first round draft pick for the Maple Leafs. And in oh. February of 2022, he was diagnosed with a brain tumor. And the Leafs just announced that he died recently. It's a shame. It's a real tragedy. Very sad. Yeah. Rest in peace, Amaroff. Rest in peace. All right, All fellas. Right. Come on back soon, Milk and Bison. Milk and Bison, yeah. we need you back. We got uh, we got NFL and college. Can't do them without you. We need all five quarterbacks for episode one twenty eight. So so we might be telling, we might be telling people next week how to how to draft in a fantasy football league. Oh, Stay God. tuned. I have a whole <laughs> new strategy. See you next week. <laughs> what map Bye, are you on? Like mock draft forty five. <laughs> oh, I lost count.